So technology isn't everything. That doesn't roll off the tongue easily for someone who's been in technology for over 25 years. I helped build one of the first cell phone networks in the United States in 1994. And from there was a part of wireless networks from 1G. Remember the brick phones? Yes, I was part of that, all the way to 5G. And although technology certainly drives our innovations, it simply can't be the reason that we launch things, nor can it forget the most important part of why we do what we do, the customer. What follows are lessons that I learned transitioning off of a working platform that had been in service longer than I have been in the workforce. And trust me, that's saying something. I joined Somos in 2018 as Vice President of Engineering. At Somos, we empower trusted connections between brands, consumers, and communities. Our vision is to be the leading provider of the trusted information that drives global connections. We have a unique position in telecom, providing secure, reliable, and neutral stewardship of our industry's data. This allows our customers to focus on their core businesses, knowing that their data and its administration is fair, accurate, and secure. And we collaborate with our customers on industry issues like fraud, identity management, and calling attestation. Our portfolio includes industry standards that you may already know about, like the toll-free number registry. It administers toll-free numbers. Or TSS registry, which provides text enablement of toll-free numbers. Or RouteLink, which provides direct access to toll-free uh, toll call routing. Or maybe you've heard of our newer offerings, like TFN Identity, which provides caller ID for toll-free numbers. Or Marketplace, which is really fun because it allows high-value toll-free numbers to be sold and bought um, on a, a secure platform, which we haven't had. We've been providing services to the industry as SMS 800 since 1993, and we rebranded in 2015 as SOMOS, which means we are, and it highlights our commitment and collaboration with our customers. By the numbers, 20 years of administration, 41 million toll-free numbers, and over 450 toll-free number providers. At SOMOS, we are customer obsessed. It's even in our name, right? So when we embarked on this multi-year transition off this legacy platform to a more modern and robust system that would better serve our customers' needs and supercharge their businesses, which depend on our product, we put them first. We had to do this migration. You could no longer compile parts of this code base. And hear me now, friends, PL1 code. Literally, people who coded this product left the workforce 10 or more years ago and were living fantastic retirement lives in beautiful beachy places. Some components didn't even have functional source code. When those parts failed, all I could do was turn it off, turn it back on again, and hope that it worked. Seriously, what's worse than that, right? We could definitely give our customers a better experience in terms of performance, time to market with new features, and better operational support too. We didn't take that if you build it, they will come approach. <clears throat> we put our customers first. We have an established history of providing long lasting solutions and intended to replace one enduring solution with a better one. We aim to create an engaged ecosystem experience with our new APIs and the data that they manipulate that fosters partnership and the ability for our customers to exploit the data. So we gave clear communication. We set the stage for this multi-year transition. We gave all the what's, the why's, and the how long's so everyone could be prepared. We are all about high customer touch support. We talked to our customers, we established user groups, we got feedback and worked with our industry and regulators. We provided robust migration guides, training sessions, and webinars, and direct support really to anybody who asked for it. We showed our customers how our new stack and our APIs would improve their experience dramatically. The graphic shows the five things that customers do most with our TFN registry in the busiest hour of the day. Our new platform was gonna provide a 98% increase in productivity, 98. For a system known for processing very large batch type transactions, this kind of improvement was highly desirable. So this transition was gonna be really simple, right? I thought so. We gave long awaited features, this modern UI, better identity management, analytics and reporting. And did I mention, 
the uh, Wicked Fast APIs. So APIs hold the key. They hold the key to this modernization and the effort that we put. They expose access to our key data in ways that protect the integrity of the systems and enable secure and governed access during our transition, which was really important for our business. We introduced the APIs fairly early in the process, and they allowed us to obscure some of the more challenging aspects of the transition from our customers' view. I knew these APIs would be a high-impact revolution for our customers, as customer acquisition, affiliate, and distribution channels, a way to increase retention, and an upsell driver. I was really excited for what our customers were going to be able to accomplish. And then this guy. I like to call him No Way Joe. Maybe you've heard some of these before in your own work, probably so, but I was deflated to hear your customers say, you're not helping. Ouch. Years of work, endless effort, and what they were really telling me was that we were not adding compelling value for them. Don't worry, this is not a tearjerker. I'm skipping ahead a little bit, but it was all okay. The cutover was successful. And we even finished a little early that weekend and got some necessary sleep. We all celebrated and watched our customers reap the benefits of this new and powerful system immediately. Our nearly non-existent API usage represented by those blue bars there skyrocketed. In fact, in those three months, the new system served over a billion transactions. That was over 70% of the total for the entire prior year. Hindsight being 2020, it's been a year now. How did we do? We did some things right. Managing customer expectations through uncertainty, giving them a long runway, lots of information, and training that paid off. We encouraged heavy involvement from our customers from the beginning. We faced larger chunks of the effort, like starting the UI very early. That gave us critical feedback for the final solution. We tackled our technical shifts in phases as well. Identity and user management first, then business logic, then data layer, reporting and analytics. We ensured a substantial rollback period in case we weren't successful, but that was never gonna happen. We began our next evolution even before we finished the cutover. We moved all our development, monitoring, and even disaster recovery to the cloud before launch. We could have done some things better. You know, timing, they say, is everything. But there are many tools now to help you migrate essential services from mainframe to cloud. Rehosting with Batch, application replatforming. Amazon has a partner that swears they can do it in six weeks. I'd like to see that. But when our journey began, not so much. How could you ever know when the right time to do it is? You can't. You have to follow the 80-20 rule and be ready to pivot. Our main concern was continuity of this critical service, and we undertook a very conservative approach. Surely we missed some chances to optimize along the way. That decision focused on technologies we now want to evolve. Legacy product modernization, it isn't an end into itself. It's really a way to create space and flexibility so that you can take on the next set of challenges. Our phased approach meant that we were evolving processes and policies during the project. Sometimes switching out large parts of the aircraft while in the air. We also lacked the shared set of metrics across the teams. And it sort of speaks to that culture that Asanka was talking about. If we had different motivations, we didn't get those harmonized until the very end. And then things moved a lot more smoothly. Unfortunately, our plan also included shifts in the API along the way that were disruptive. And this leads me to Agile and how it played a part in what we did. In the age of Agile, software developers seem to be a little afraid of over-designing upfront. And as a result, sometimes we abandon architectural thinking, upfront design, or diagramming and modeling, the mainstays of techniques. It's an overtilt. It's a repulsion to the heavy-handed processes that we used to have, but I view it as a, a misinterpretation of the manifesto. Not everything can be solved on a whiteboard or a sticky note. We need to consider the larger impacts of what we do. And enough vision is required to lay a proper foundation. You simply can't get to the first version of code without design. And worse, if what you deliver doesn't meet the needs of your audience, then you failed. In its best form, I think agile development exists within a well-planned larger program that has a focus on adding overall value. What's best to code first may not be best to sell to customers first. There were false starts from code converters to fundamental misses in the complexity of the system that caused early setbacks. And we made, uh, we broke some of Ginger's cardinal rules actually. Entanglement between logic and data layers, hard coding, gasp, and a lack of crucial modularity. 
If you make a mess, you have to clean it up. That's the first cardinal rule. We reached stability within 45 days of cutover and immediately began working on the next round of transformations. We're moving to more advanced technology as we speak, more like our other products, microservices, containers, serverless, stealth deployments. We never stop innovating. So when No Way Joe started to make himself known before our cutover, we had to pause. This cutover had to happen. Our tech was so much better. We had the right messaging and the right planning. What happened? On the one hand, I had hundreds of people all working diligently and fervently around the clock on this singular mission to deliver this great experience to our customers. And on the other, I had customers who really didn't want what we were selling. This brings me to my first recognition and public service announcement number one. Your mileage on the hype cycle will probably vary. My team had done a great job figuring out all the technical details of this very complicated transition off a mainframe. All the phases, security, data migrations, and a detailed runbook that literally was a ream tall. I wanted our customers to share in the bliss of this eminently permeable enterprise, where business capabilities are abstracted and superlinearly scaling integration in the digital economy. But we had to make those promises real to the customer, tangible, useful, necessary. I'm sure you're all familiar with the hype cycle. Big research firms publish tech hype cycles quarterly, and we all watch as really exciting technology ebbs and flows and then often disappears within them. Gardner considered APIs like the ones we were launching as entering the plateau of productivity on the right side. That was back in 2016. Here we were in 2019. Defect management before cutover turned into a huge education process for me not just the customers. I found myself saying, but it's working like designed, only to find out it wasn't working the way that the customer wanted it to. In our case, the cutover was multi-year and things changed and how they used the system had changed too. We had to give on some things. Customer test environments and legacy interfaces were gonna stay up longer than we wanted. Deployments were gonna be spaced out farther than we wanted too. Frustrated customers took time away from my all-important engineering work, or so I thought. Here's what I recognized. We thought customers were hanging on too long to what we had, and our customers thought we were pushing them to adopt way too early. And now my second recognition in PSA number two. It isn't about your awesome tech. That stings a little, I know, it stings me too. We did all the right technical work. We had a great architecture. We had really strong partnerships. We had an excellent transition plan and we were going to achieve the mission, but it isn't enough. Merriam Webster will tell you that quality and value are degrees of excellence and a relative worth. What they won't tell you is that these are measurements taken by your customer when they deal with you and your products. We needed a better goal. We needed to deliver an experience where the promises of this new API first product, new business models, new revenue streams could be seamlessly and painlessly realized by our customers. So I know you all know that with Google, we're all experts at everything from doctoring to lawyering. So I'm no marketeer, I'm an engineer, but it seemed like we needed to change the conversation. It was clear to me that we hadn't successfully sold our customers on the goodness they were about to get. We were an agile shop, and with our other products, which were newer and began their lives in the cloud, we were able to be nimbler and to make small changes quicker, to have that intensive feedback that we crave. But a huge shift like this one is different. We had many legacy interfaces, and to them, our new APIs seemed like a totally foreign language. Although instantly better for some of our customers, we were upheaving the entire businesses of others. So a 10x improvement is great tech, right? But we still had to take a better look at our customers, each with their own needs and attributes to understand their business flows and their value on their terms. We were saying things like, you can process faster. And they were saying, I can't keep up with what I have. We were saying, you get new features, leverage new channels, connect to new opportunities. And they were saying, I'm not sure I understand the ones I have. It's not enough to say it's better. You must know enough about them to know why it's better for them. That likely means process improvements, changing the way that you look at them, talk to them, monitor them, experience them. 
your experience in technology may be broader than theirs, and what's obvious to you may be a mystery to them. And never forget that you're only peeking through the windows of their businesses. Sometimes great tech isn't good enough in the mind of your customer where that value lives. So why did we do it? These are really great reasons for Somos. Cheaper, leaner, faster. It wasn't an impulse. We did our homework. We thought it all out. Lower costs, leaner operations, getting rid of those pesky legacy interfaces that were holding back our technology transformation. Who wouldn't want all of that? But what would it do to my, my customer? How did that sit in the mind of the person I was trying to sell to? In my case, this took the front seat and speed and time to market and all the new features took a back seat. What was obvious to me that our new system and its new APIs would make their businesses run faster, they could do more. And I had math, really good math to prove it to them. Not obvious to me, our customers had used the old interface for decades and they were happy for them. It still worked. This upgrade didn't feel like a tangible improvement. It was work. It was work to change to the APIs and they were satisfied with the performance that they had. So why would they make this change? We needed a new mission to change the view from new to advantageous by knowing who they are. I had to listen, really listen, without an assumption about what I thought I knew about them or without the urge to tell them why what I had was going to be better and to acknowledge that some of them had pain with my pain. I was saying pain? How can you have pain with this plan? You're getting so much wonderful stuff. But this leads me to PSA number three. I expected to hear about slow processing, lack of new features, slowness to market, and frankly, that they were uncomfortable knowing our technology was outdated. Nope. They had built successful businesses that worked using what they already had. They told me about competing priorities, lack of funding, lack of resources, and a lack of understanding in their own businesses about what the improvements could do for their business. And then there was just fear of the magnitude. How bad will this be for me? For some, it was fear of having to learn something new, literally. I mean, we face it, we're inundated with change every day, constantly. New phones, new apps, new content, new movies, new binge watching. Until last week, my husband thought TikTok was a desktop clock app. Sometimes new can be daunting. At our annual summit, the whole room sighed with relief when we demonstrated how easy it is to use a swagger file. Here's a hint, you don't have to be a coder. APIs are no longer just developer tools. They're strategic assets for all businesses and nearly anyone can use them. Those that weren't ultimately wooed by my API goodness appreciated my partnership and my offers to help, championing for their needs and sometimes just simply listening to them. We evolved our views on what it is to be a technologist at Somos. Yes, we architect, design and produce amazing products with the best partners and the best technologies. But we also evangelize not just for tech, but for our customers and their business needs fulfilled by our technical expertise. We used all the tools in our toolkit to provide the right thing at the right time. We doubled down on our newfound understanding of quality and became super fans of our customers and the feedback they were willing to share. Our deliveries not only had to be the right thing at the right time, they had to be surgical because we judge our work from our customer's perspective. Now, not every customer is a no way Joe, for sure. And our customers are wonderful people who showed their tenacity in so many ways during the transition. But early adopter Pam here is exactly in tune with what we're trying to do. She's already innovating in her mind. She's jumping at the chance to get started and she makes the commitment for her business to adapt. I hope you all have a lot of Pams. This leads me to PSA number four. Never ever take an early adopter for granted. Early adopters will give you the best feedback. They share their stories and they show others the way. And sometimes they nudge adoption with good old fashioned competition. We were very fortunate to have many. Ali Bajanfar is one. He's the CTO of ATL Communications, an advanced provider of toll-free number management services. Ali has a passion for innovation and immediately recognized opportunity for his business. Okay, a little data, but I promise I'll be gentle. On the left side of the chart, you can see July 2018, and on the right is 2020. Here in the middle is our cutover in June 2019. 
the y-axis shows orders of magnitude, increasing from zero in the lower left corner. These lines represent different interfaces on our product. Our goal post cutover was to get all the customers using these new Wicked Fast APIs represented by that blue line in the upper right corner. Although the new system made all the interfaces faster, as you can see by the yellow, red, and purple lines, I'd like to draw your attention to the shift between the green and blue. Ali's migration story started back here. He and his team started a rapid experimentation phase prior to cutover. And within about a month after cutover, they had abandoned the main legacy interface. I was so excited. Then you can see the information that drives his business coming to him faster and faster through these APIs. Just as his API usage starts to peak here in 2020, you can also see him start to abandon another legacy interface in yellow on the right side. Okay, pretty chart, but what does that really all mean, Ginger? What it means is that his team could do more of what they needed to do faster. These are the top functions that our system performs for customers. And you can see the rapid change post cutover and throughput. But I think this is the real picture. What could tripling the speed of your access to the information that drives your business due to the bottom line? Well, for ATL, 14 times faster, 500% reduction in time, lower risk. This was credible validation that we weren't crazy. This was indeed a game changer for our customers. So clearly our mission had to go beyond simply bringing technology that could affect this magnitude of change. It had to extend fully into the minds of the customers to have a desire to achieve it. So here's what I learned. Yet another PSA, you may never fully understand the impact that what you build creates. Robert Cecil Martin, also known as Uncle Bob, is an American software engineer, instructor, and best-selling author. He's most recognized for developing software design principles and being a founder of the influential Agile Manifesto. He said, be a true craftsman and take the utmost care in what you create. And I like that because the truth is you don't know the end cases of what you create, especially as we move toward this marketplace of aggregated service providing. If you don't believe that a life could really depend on it, look at what's happening with Toyota and Tesla lately. It's tragedy. Tiny pieces of code that were not fully tested, probably because that person never really understood the impact of what they created, caused loss of life. In response to the coronavirus pandemic, the United States Department of Health and Human Services set up a toll-free number for outbound calls so patients could get their COVID-19 test results. But there was a growing concern. People don't answer calls if they don't know who's calling, right? Nobody answers 844 or whatever. And so people weren't getting this vital information. We stepped in and provided caller ID for that toll-free number so we could let people know that HHS was trying to reach them with vital news about their COVID test. Our impact was not just the one person answering the call, but all the people who would have been affected without that knowledge. At Somos, we are the underpinnings of COVID hotlines, hurricane relief numbers, emergency services of many kinds. We know what's at stake and we act like it. I know you're all really smart folks, and I thought I was one too, but never assume you understand your customer's experience and never take it for granted. We were customer focused, truly. We had awareness of the customer's identity, who they are, and contextual understanding of what they were doing with our products. But we needed obsession. We had to use our knowledge and our analytics to build anticipatory understanding. What could they do? And then predictive understanding. What must we have to satisfy their needs, especially the ones they don't know they have yet? It was Jeff Bezos who famously said, even when they don't know it, customers want something better. The skill is knowing what that something is. And we found it's not just about the big data, the macro trends, it's the small data, that detailed picture of every individual. You must invest your customer in the changes that you intend to make, but you also have to invest yourself in what your customer could become because of them. It's not about today's NPS score. It's about the next 10 years of NPS scores. 
to create and maintain demand for your services, you have to have trust. Aim for the richest experience possible. The best technology eases that transition for everyone transformed by it. Probably like many of you, I'm drawn to the newest, shiniest, coolest way to make things work. But I've learned to meet my customers where they are. I, I know already that you practice good hygiene and taxonomies, authentication, security, and user management. But here are the things that made the difference for us with our customer. Dynamic documentation. Developers don't like to read anything. And by the time you share it, it's already out of date. Interactive everything. Click to chat for developers and aspiring non-developers to see how your APIs work and ideally provide them information specific to their programming language of choice. This includes your SDKs too. Develop for the widest possible audience and don't just think developer. If we believe they're for everyone, then they should be for everyone too. You need documentation, test scripts, modeling layers that are easily understood and methods that are applicable to your particular user base because now you understand them so much better. In our case, it was really truly something as simple as Swagger files that showed the power of our RESTful APIs. Simple backend servers, UI kits, they were very instructive too. To give developers working sample apps to show how the APIs are meant to be used. You know what they do most. Providing robust samples can help them get the best out of what you offer and share your best practices around development, performance, and security. And I know you all know that API breaches are the largest source of data breaches by far. You know how your customers use your system. Show them how to do it the right way with what you provide that's new. Sandboxes, of course, the ultimate productivity solution for anyone's ecosystem is to give them a place to play with all these things. And if you're super cool, then let them pick a template, configure it, and have the server and kit code pushed to their GitHub account and deployed into their cloud instances. Make it as easy as possible, reducing friction wherever you can. Version your APIs only if you must. It's one of my biggest regrets about the cutover. Adding is great. Reworking, not so great. Customers will never love you for that one. And it seemed like a very small thing, but for our customers, leaving behind some of the old technology that they were accustomed to, like VPNs, made them feel a bit leery. And we couldn't assume that they understood all the precautions that we took in the new system and how they'd work together to provide a highly reliable and secure experience. We had to show them. And here we are at PSA number six. Your old metrics probably aren't good enough. You have to build in new thinking right up front and then watch your, your customers carefully use what you've created. Super fan or super stalker? I wasn't sure sometimes with my customers. We watched very carefully. How long did it take a developer to get up and running? I found a huge range from days to months, but with outreach, I knew I could shorten that time. As each developer's on-app productivity changed, Who's struggling? What are they struggling with? Yeah, you can see that and you should look. Keep a watch list of the most used functionality and know the patterns of your data to identify red flags and troubling behavior. 51% of customers will never do business with the company after one bad experience. What if they never have to have that experience in the first place because you were watching? Evaluate your direct value for customer facing aspects of what you build and your technical debt and operational efficiencies on the backside. Probably all of you practice some form of agile development and you ascribe customer value to the stories that you create. Do you ever ask the customers if they agree with your assessments? Could be enlightening. How does what you build measure up on the bottom line? It's more than staying on budget or cost containment or sales numbers. If your customers can do more, did they? Can you prove it? Can you see it in your revenue? And sometimes going faster has drawbacks. Yes, not all tonnage is useful tonnage on the bottom line. How can you move your customers toward efficiency or higher value features? We found our customers were backdoor engineering answers that they could get directly using the new APIs, but they hadn't figured that out yet. That backdoor engineering was consuming a lot of resources on both sides. By highlighting this metric to our business teams, they were able to reach out to customers, understand their business models better, and refine the way we work together, or find new avenues to monetize all the tonnage that we were carrying. Money's always good, right? So what really matters? What's really important? Grounding yourself in the recognition of your impact to your customers 
and to their businesses and to their customers and targeting the right problems to solve, hopefully ones with low competition and a high degree of novelty. Priming your business and your customers. Is your business ready to advocate for what you built to drive this new thing? You can't launch until everyone's on board. It can never be tech just for its own sake. Not assuming, but embracing your customer's experience. Your customer has to be ready because you've reduced the friction at every touch point along the way. Visioning, development, launch, and you proved your readiness to support them through the transition and adoption. And yes, yes, my favorite part, building the strong technical solution. It's always the foundation, but it's one that's anticipated your customers' needs for years to come and is built on the right technology for the job. I lived on the raggedy edge of cellular and data networks for over 20 years, from X.25 to edge-based AI and flying autonomous vehicles. But trust me, your technology game is only as strong as your, desi your customer's desire for what you produced. Advanced tech will not further your business if you fail to identify the right solution for the customer, embrace and advance their experience, and ensure they can immediately use what you produce. Solve the right problems the right way, whether it's bleeding edge, fast following, or well-established technology. I encourage everyone to be a student of technology, an authority in their industry, but a super fan of their customers. Thank you all very much.